Um, hello, everyone. I am Ellen, and um, for the last year and a half, I have been working on Cisco spawning up in Shimo Bay on Lake Ontario. Um, and if you've seen some of my other talks, you've seen bits and pieces of what is going on in this one today. But today, I want to uh, present the uh, finished, completed egg pumping uh, results, um, which I'm very happy to announce have led to confirmation of Cisco spawning in Shimo Bay for the first time in a long time. Uh, so, first, a little outline of what I'm going to talk about today. Uh, First, I want to go over a little bit of background of the story of Cisco and Lake Ontario with the Great Lakes. Uh, and then over the methods, it looks like um, my slides have been creatively rearranged by this computer. So if you uh, excuse the, mod the modern art look of my presentation, I apologize. Um, anyway, the, uh, I was going to say, the methods I'm going to talk about, um, the design of our egg pumping device and um, the genetic uh, analysis of our eggs, uh, and then the results of and the subsequent conclusions from um, this project, and then uh, if I have time, I'll touch on a few of the future projects that we're working on um, that have arisen from the results of this project. Uh, so first, a little bit of background, background on Cisco. Uh, although it may not seem like it today, Cisco were once a very important commercial and recreational fishery in the, across the entire Great Lakes region. Um, in the late 1800s, Everman and Smith wrote that in all the Great Lakes, the Lake Herring or Cisco is more abundant than any other whitefish. It has taken up enormous quantities each year, and in most of the lakes, it's the object of a special fishery. Uh, as unfortunately, as we know, um, these uh, days of Cisco bliss were not meant to last, and uh, the population declined, and ultimately the fishery um, was over by the 1950s. And they declined due to uh, several reasons, mostly the same complex cocktail reasons that every uh, Great Lakes fishery has um, undergone. But perhaps overfishing and uh, destruction of spawning habitat were the two biggest factors. Um, anyway, today, you would be hard pressed to find a single fisherman in New York that knows what Cisco even is or what it looks like, uh, let alone actually fishes for one. Um, so it's a very different story today. And, um, but even though there's no uh, commercial, really no commercial or recreational fishery left on the Ontario, uh, it's still a very important fish. We shouldn't give up on it. And uh, the reason we really care about it today is um, for a completely different reason, which is as a prey fish species for lake trout and Atlantic salmon. Um, unlike alewife, which is the dominant prey fish species in Lake Ontario, uh, cisco are very low in biomass, so they are a much healthier snack for lake trout and uh, other great lakes <coughs> than alewife. So if we promote the restoration of these native prey fish species, such as cisco in uh, Lake Ontario, we can in turn promote the restoration of uh, great lakes salmon. Uh, the Cisco Restoration Project um, is a collaboration between Cornell University, uh, the DC, USGS, and uh, funded by a grant from the Nature Conservancy. Um, and uh, we have three main goals, which the first one is to evaluate the status of the population in Lake Ontario. The second is to locate the actual spawning site. And the third is to identify any limitations to recruitment that may be affecting uh, the population. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know a lot of the information we need to know in order to restore Cisco in Lake Ontario, so that's the whole goal of this project. Um, however, there is one thing we know about, at least one thing we know about uh, Cisco spawning in Lake Ontario, and that is that spawning adult, adults return to Shimmel Bay in the fall, November and December, around spawning time. Uh, and the DC and USGS Tunison have been successfully track netting uh, spawning adults on Johnson Shoal, which is a shoal in Shimmel Bay. Uh, for several years, and um, so we know that they're there, but we didn't really know where they were spawning, what they were spawning on, or really what was going on. Um, so we uh, decided to try and investigate that. Unfortunately, uh, Cisco have an annoying habit of spawning right when the ice is starting to form on the lake. Uh, they like to spawn right when the temperature is getting down to freezing, and uh, then the eggs overwinter under several feet of ice throughout the entire winter and then hatch out in the spring. So uh, it makes it a little bit of a challenge to study. But uh, we decided to come up with a, we thought we should come up with a creative solution to this unique problem. Um, and so we decided to use a uh, specially designed egg pumping um, system that we built. Uh, egg pumping is a method that has been used in many different systems, uh, but usually it consists of a very large, either shipboard or towed by ship uh, pump that's towed behind the boat um, in open water. And uh, as you can see, there's no open water in Shimo Bay in uh, December or January. Um, so we uh, had to redesign the egg pump um, to work in a stationary position through the ice. Uh, anyway, so I wanted to go over a little bit of how we did that. Um, 
the first thing we would do is we'd go out and use an auger to drill four holes about half a meter apart um, in a square. Uh, and then we use a chainsaw to slice between these holes to create one solid block of ice that we would then lift out um, of the ice. And uh, there was a lot of ice on the bay, up to a meter thick in some sites. Um, this is one of the blocks that we pulled out. Um, and I've included some USGS technicians for scale. Um, so you can, you can see that we're dealing with a lot of ice on Shimo Bay. Um, but once we got this block of ice out, we could deploy all of our equipment through the hole. Um, and the equipment, in this case, being uh, this box. Um, it's a welded metal box. It's about half a meter square or 10 centimeters high. And uh, Brian Young built it for us. And it's uh, got four eyelets uh, that are attached to ropes so we can maneuver it through the hole in the ice um, and set down the substrate. And then there is a pipe fitted to the center, which is what provides the suction. And this leads uh, up to the top of the ice, uh, where we had a three inch diaphragm pump. And we chose to use a diaphragm pump because we didn't want to use um, any pump that had an impeller. We were worried that it would chop up the eggs and, or get caught with any debris that was coming up uh, from the bottom. And we wanted the eggs to stay you know, intact and, and whole, whole and hopefully alive. Uh, so we would run the pump for five minutes at each site to try to control sampling effort between sites. And uh, all the outflow from the pump was filtered through this basket. It's actually two laundry baskets that were sandwiched together. Um, and there are several layers of fiberglass uh, window screen mesh uh, between the two layers. And this lets all the outflow from the pump, I mean it's a huge pump, so there's lots of water going everywhere. But it flows all straight through the basket and it just leaves the eggs and any small amount of debris we got behind. So it was very easy to pick the eggs out. Um, and any eggs we got, here's one, the little cute little baby inside. Um, if any eggs we got, uh, we would take back to the lab and we photographed and measured them under the scope. Um, and even though they are adorable, um, they had to you know, be sacrificed for science, so we fixed them in 95% ethanol and sent them off uh, for genetic analysis. So uh, Cisco and, well, Corgonin eggs, we knew that we had Corgonin uh, eggs uh, because First, um, the size and the shape and the number of oil globules. Secondly, it's the only thing that's crazy enough to spawn this time of year in Shimo Bay. Uh, however, we uh, didn't know if they were lake white fish or cisco. Um, they both occur around the same time um, in Shimo Bay. So it could be either one. So we used uh, a genetic barcoding technique, which um, since most of us, I think a lot of us took the workshop, we're all experts. So I'll just do a brief overview of that. Um, we used a genetic barcoding technique to distinguish between the species. Uh, we used a region of mitochondrial DNA uh, called cytochrome C oxidase, which is commonly known as the barcoding region. Um, and it's a very commonly used method for distinguishing between species easily and cheaply. Uh, the way that it distinguishes between the species is that you use a restriction enzyme uh, to clip the DNA in different spots, and it clips lake whitefish and cisco DNA separately, or differently, I should say. Uh, and this uh, creates different banding patterns on the gel once you run it. So uh, we tested it. We could test our unknown eggs and then also some known adult samples and compare them and see what we had. So this is a picture of one of our gels. Um, it's a little hard to read, but I will walk you through it. Uh, the first row on top is a size standard. So this just lets you know how big the fragments are that you're seeing on the gel. Um, the next four rows below are Cisco and bloater DNA. Um, so you can see the Cisco and bloater DNA gets put into three fragments that are farther to the right. Um, you see those three different bands there. Um, and then we also put some known lake whitefish on there. And uh, the lake whitefish gets put into just two segments and it's farther to the left. So you can see a distinct separation between the two different species. Uh, this, the, it can, this method can tell between lake whitefish and then what's known as the Cisco bloater complex. Uh, it can't tell between Cisco and Loader, but we weren't really concerned about that because the maximum depth of the bay is only 28 feet deep. Um, we don't have any bloater in the bay, and uh, we only get like whitefish and cisco in the trap net, so um, we were not concerned about finding uh, about telling between cisco and bloater. Uh, so once we have the nodes and we can see which one's cisco, which one's like like whitefish, we can run our eggs, and the eggs are down here, and you can see that they show the uh, three different bands that identify them as cisco. So these eggs are our cisco eggs. Uh, so uh, for the entire project, we pumped at 30 different sites around Shimo Bay, um, and at all those sites, we found 59 corrigoning eggs total. Um, of these 59 eggs, 41 of them contained viable DNA that we were able to, um, to use to identify them to species. 
Um, and of these 41, every single one was identified with Cisco eggs. So we have 41 confirmed Cisco eggs uh, found, on the sh found in the bay. Uh, some people ask me why only 41 could be ID'd instead of all 59, and that's because we did get quite a number of dead eggs. Uh, if you look at the two pictures on the bottom, the one on the left is a dead egg. Uh, you can see there's a little bit of material left in the middle, but there's no developed yolk larvae, there's no yolk sac, all the oil globules have disappeared. Um, it's just dead, and these have very low uh, levels of viable DNA in them, so they're, they usually don't get ID'd. Uh, but the one on the right is uh, a developed larvae, and you can see him all curled up in that egg, in that egg and that's a school egg. Um, so this is a map of all of our locations in uh, Shamo Bay. Uh, the bay, uh, anyway, there's the bay, Point Salubris is a uh, peninsula that juts out into the bay. I've gone ahead and colored uh, gray all of the locations, uh, all of the sites within the bay that are less than three meters, so you can easily see the shallow areas in the bay, including the shoals. Uh, the main shoal in the bay is Johnson Shoal, uh, and that's where we set the trap nets to get the, uh, to get the spawning adults. But there's also a few other shoals in the bay. Uh, Middle Shoal and Herrick Shoal, farther over the left, are also shoal areas. Uh, and then anything with a green circle is where we found conf genetically confirmed Cisco eggs. Um, and the size of the circle indicates how many uh, eggs we found there. The largest circle up on Johnson Shoal represents 12 eggs. So that was the max number of eggs we got in, uh, at a site. And then the black dots are sites where we pumped and we either didn't find any eggs or we only found dead eggs. So we didn't find any live ones and we didn't have any confirmed Cisco eggs. Uh, so as you can see from this map, they're very closely associated with shoal areas. They really <coughs> seem like the shallow, rocky, um, shoal types of uh, areas around Johnson Shoal and Herrick Shoal. Uh, we did find one egg on Middle Shoal, but it was dead, so we didn't get an idea off of it. Um, and then also way up on the uh, top upper right-hand corner, there's one uh, we found a few live eggs there, um, and that is kind of a nearshore rocky area that's really similar to a shoal. Uh, so yeah, they seem to very heavily prefer these shoal areas. Uh, and even though we did want to find out where they were actually spawning the baby, we also wanted to know what kind of substrate they were spawning on. So at each of these sites when we drilled the hole, we also dropped a CVR camera down and uh, took a picture of the substrate. And uh, this is a box and whisker plot of the uh, egg numbers that were collected on different substrates in the bay. So we have um, shoal type substrate, so that's defined as anything that is shallow, so less than four meters deep, um, and rocky habitat located um, in the middle of the bay or away from shore. It's kind of a classic you know, shoal that comes up from the bottom of the bay. We also have near shore rocky habitat, which is the same as shoal in every way, except instead of being located in the middle of the bay, it's uh, right next to the shore. Um, but the actual substrate and both of those are the same. And then we also had muddy and weedy uh, habitats and other. Um, as, and as you can see, every single egg that we found was either on a shoal, <coughs> rocky shoal, or in a rocky near shore site. They really um, seem to just really be honing into these shallow rocky shoal areas. Um, they're not, we didn't find any eggs on muddy or weedy habitats. Uh, so in conclusion, um, Cisco are spawning in Bay, which seems kind of like an obvious and not very profound statement, um, but <laughs> uh, once I show you this data, but uh, it's very exciting. We haven't had confirmed Cisco spawning um, in the bay for a very long time. So now we know where, not only that it's happening in Shimo Bay, but also where, um, what type of substrate they and where they are spawning. Um, we really see that they really prefer that rocky, shallow, shoal type habitat, um, and they seem to be very closely associated with those shoals. Uh, and another thing we found out is that uh, the egg pumping method is a really effective method of sampling uh, overwintering eggs through the ice. Uh, it's a really good, nice, creative solution for any of us that study uh, winter spawning fish. It's very useful. Um, and some things that we're now working on that have arisen from this project. Uh, this last fall, we uh, also did an egg survey, but instead of using egg pumping, we tried out egg mats. Um, and the benefit of these is that they give us uh, the ability to calculate a density. So not only can we get a little more information about the production coming off this shoal, but also we can more reliably compare the density of eggs between the sites. Um, the, we control the effort um, as much as possible on the egg pumping, but it doesn't give you a true density, just uh, kind of a relative, um, a relative um, abundance. And so um, this will give us more information about that. Um, and we're also looking uh, at larval fish. Last spring we collected thousands of uh, Corgonian larvae and uh, we're gonna do the same thing this spring, hopefully. Um, and just like the eggs, it's uh, the 
Corridonian, Lake Whitefish, and Cisco larvae are notoriously difficult to ID. Um, and we have not yet had, we have not yet had a confirmed um, Cisco larvae found in Shimo Bay. Um, so we decided to use the same genetic uh, method that we did on the eggs uh, on the larvae, and that's what we're, I'm working on right now. Um, we actually ran the first gel from this project a couple weeks ago, and three of the larvae turned out to be Cisco. So we have confirmed Cisco larvae in Shimo Bay, which is very exciting. Um, so once we get all of those ID, we'll be able to look at the distribution between like whitefish and Cisco, um, see if there's any, um, if they're the same, if they're different, and also any sort of diet preference or overlap of larvae stage. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody who helped with this project, um, especially DC, Tunison, USGS, Oswego, um, everyone who made this project possible because it could have been done without you. And with that, I'll take any questions. Thank you. How expensive is the fish, the two questions, how expensive is the fish pump and how do you collect the larval fish? Okay, um, the fish pump itself, uh, we were very fortunate that we were able to borrow one. Um, I would have, I have two pieces of advice for anyone who wants to do this. One, find one to borrow because it's several thousand dollars to buy one, which is very expensive. Um, and I would really recommend getting a diaphragm pump. It's very tempting to go for the cheaper impeller pumps, but you really don't want to chew up those eggs. Like, you know, once you pop an egg, it's, it's gone. So um, either borrow one, we were fortunate to borrow one from Oswego, or you can actually rent them. And for the first days that we went out, we actually rented them. And I think it was um, $200 or less to rent it for a day. I think we found one place up in Watertown that was about $120 a day. Mm -hmm. um, so we only went out maybe five days. So the cost is actually pretty low if you rent it, but far, of course, it's obviously preferable. Um, the larvae were connected with the over collecting the new stem bed. So we had six different sites throughout the day, um, and we did uh, two replicates um, once a week for four weeks. So, Alan, you know that uh, over the last decade we've collected larvae and have never found yes. a system that all lake white fish. Yeah, I know. <laughs> so, do you think that there's some bottleneck between the stage where you found them and where we were collecting them? Or do you think there's some major change in the system that now the Cisco are actually spawning and working? Yeah, so um, that is something that's, like, you guys have so many larvae from all the years and they're all white fish. And then um, they also collected larvae this last year and they raised some of them up and those ones turned out to be lake white fish too. So um, there's a few things that might be going on, and we're um, looking into expanding this project, and we're actually working on writing some grants to um, maybe go on further with this. Um, one thing that could be happening is there is a difference in the spatial distribution of the whitefish in the Cisco. So uh, I know that you did some um, larval netting out in the bay as well, but uh, the ones that you raised up came from the same, correct? Yeah, so there was a shore same. So I don't know, maybe there's a little difference there. Um, another thing that actually is very possible, um, I think, is that uh, they, not only do they look very similar and in different systems they can't converge visually, um, but there's a high possibility of hybridization between cisco's and whitefish. It can go both ways. You can get females and males of either species hybridizing. And uh, I've been talking to Matt Hare at Cornell and Wendy Stott at USGS um, and looking into a project to look at hybridization between cisco's and whitefish. Um, they get them out in uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and they call it New Cisco. Um, and so they, uh, it's, it is possible. So we're thinking, we're thinking of taking some of these larvae and looking at um, microsatellite, um, microsatellite genetic data and seeing if any of them have uh, hybridized over the years, which might explain why they look exactly the same. Yeah. One more. One more question? Sorry. Yes. Uh, yesterday, Andrew Miano. Uh, showed an egg predation experiment. Yes. Shoals got really hammered by round gobies. Yes. So, did you see any round gobies, and what's the potential for that? Um, we haven't. There are lots of gobies in Shimo Bay. Um, we haven't caught any because they don't get caught in our trap nets. Um, but yes, there's a high. I would say there's a high potential for egg predation by gobies in Shimo Bay. Um, I think the one thing that would maybe depress it is that the, the temperatures, the water temperatures, are so cold when they're spawning. Um, they usually spawn between two and four degrees. Um, so, I'm, I, you know, hopefully that will kind of depress the, the rate of gobi egg predation, but I have not personally looked into it. Um, but I have actually talked to Andrew about throwing some traps out there and seeing if we get any uh, doing a diet analysis in the future. All right, thank you. Okay, thanks so much.